Okay, welcome everyone back from the break. For our final presentation, I'm delighted to introduce Shimri Zemeret. Shimri is an Israeli living in the United States and a researcher and lecturer at the University of Michigan in the areas of civil society, global politics, global governance, and global governance. He has a particular interest in the area of social movement building and how to apply those principles to building our movement. Shimri has also worked on the staff of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, so he has an insider's view of that as well. Two other notable facts are that Shimri spent two years in an Israeli jail for his refusal to fight Palestinians. And on a very different note, he's also a new daddy. And as you probably heard, if you came on a moment or two ago, he just gave little Gabriella a bath. So if he's got any water or suds on him, <laughs> you'll, know, you'll know the backstory. So um, our format will be a little bit different than what we've been doing so far. That first I'll begin, we'll begin as an interview. And after a few questions, Shimri will give a brief presentation. And then following that, we'll return to the interview. And then after that, we'll open the floor for everyone's questions and comments. So I'd like to begin, Shimri, by asking you, well, first, thank you for joining us, uh, even after the bath, <laughs> and, and ask you if you could begin by telling us a bit about your own background as an activist, including a bit about your early work and what led you to the World Federalist Movement and kind of the kinds of experiences in, you had with activism, both inside and outside of the World Federalist Movement. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, I actually wanted to start by thanking all of you. I, um, as an activist, I, I talk a lot of times with uh, groups or I'm invited to, to talks and people ask me what, what gives me hope. And, um, and I think what gives me hope is to know that I'm not alone. And so being here, and I, I've been here for, uh, this is the third day, uh, and to know that all of you are here and we're working together um, is something that uh, gives me a lot of hope. So thanks for that. And thanks for inviting me. Um, and I'll also say that <laughs> I, I, you know, I spent, uh, I think something like 15 years thinking about changing global governance. But the problem with speaking to world federalists is that, that always, there's always people that have spent sometimes two or three times more than that thinking about the same subject. I mean, and it's much easier to be the only person in the room that says that and to, to, to present. <laughs> and uh, here there's a lot of people that know more than I do about this. So it's always makes me a bit anxious. Um, I, so like you said, I mean, I was, I'm, a, I'm an activist, a, a peace activist for uh, uh, 26 years. I, I started when I was 13 in the, in the Israeli-Palestinian peace movement and I uh, was part of the conscientious objector movement during the second intifada and I spent uh, two years in prison uh, or 21 months. Um, and actually I think that um, the point that, that kind of drove me to world federalism or started the, the path was actually in prison. Uh, we were moved to a civilian, a minimum security civilian prison. And for the first time there weren't walls and we could look through fences outside. It was very uh, close to the Sea of Galilee in a, in a valley, beautiful valley. Um, I had human settlements for I think 3,000 or 4,000 years, Salmon uh, Valley, and um, I. You know, it's hard. It was a long period, and and it's hard to kind of condense it into a very short uh, story. But I I think the question or the questions that I started asking were what what does it mean to serve not your nation state but the world? You know, the hu humanity, um, and also. Why are, am I seeing so many patterns that are similar? You know, I was I spent then five or six years in the peace movement and, you know, I was in prison for already a year. And uh, the, the conflict, the israeli palestinian conflict was something that I really cared about. But I, I started when I was reading about, you know, it was a time when uh, the, the counter G8 protests were happening, the WTO, um, the climate change. And, and I saw a lot of patterns that I saw as well in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I started asking what, what if these are symptoms what what is the problem um and that that was the question that led me to world federalism and i got out of prison i started working in the parliament with a palestinian parliament members a palestinian citizen of israel i i, I worked with him as a legislation advisor and i worked with him uh, 
uh, coordinating the Human Rights Caucus in the Israeli Parliament, the Knesset. And uh, I actually think it was, I, I found, you know, on his desk one day, um, uh, Globalization and Discontent by uh, Joseph Stiglitz. And I, I think there was a, a sentence there that said something along the lines of, unfortunately, we don't have a world government, something like that. Um, and another book that I was reading about globalization also mentioned this idea of, you know, global democracy. And I, I was working in the parliament and I was working with a Palestinian um, parliament member and I saw how much, how empowered he was inside a parliamentary system, although he was, you know, arguably one of the most oppressed minorities in a, in a national democracy. Um, and, and it just... There was kind of a, you know, again, a few weeks of a kind of a hot, like as it sank in. And then I, you know, I thought I can't be the first person thinking about these ideas beyond one sentence in a book. Uh, and then I Googled uh, it. And, and to my surprise, I found out that some of the people I admired the most, like Albert Einstein, and uh, it was actually a lot, a long time a long process that only ended uh, you know, a few years ago of kind of researching and digging out a lot of the history of the World Federalist Movement and finding out that people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Albert Camus and uh, Bernard Russell and, um, and uh, yeah, the list goes on as I'm sure many of you know, um, have believed in this idea. Um, and so I, uh, I think I just started writing emails to, to the different groups that I, I, uh, I saw online. Um, and some of them, many of them didn't reply, and many of the people that, and, and some of them, I think, uh, uh, did reply and, and were interested in that. Um, or kind of, I, I started, you know, sensing it out and seeing where I could fit in, how, how I can help. Um, and I also, um, I also uh, went and started, um, getting more involved in the global justice movement. So I, I was involved in organizing counter G8 summits and protests, and I was involved in the World Social Forum. Um, excuse me. Um, and I, uh, I was also then, and I, I did, a, I decided because of, I was so interested in this to do a, a master's in the London School of Economics with two of the people that are, you know, they're not federalists, but the same school, uh, like, or, like uh, which were David Held and Mary Caldor. I did a, a master's there and then I stayed to work there as a researcher. And it was when I was in London, I was uh, involved in uh, setting up or starting Occupy London. And um, so these things, and then, I mean, when I was in, when I was in, in LSC, we organized uh, uh, with Mary Caldor, we organized a workshop that was called uh, New Approaches to the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict. Um, and uh, Bill was uh, very kindly helped to think through and kind of help think, think, thinking about the conference. And what I was actually interested in doing is world federalist approaches to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, although we didn't, we didn't brand it that way. Um, and we, we talked a lot about ICC jurisdiction and so on. Um, and then um, a few years later, I um, I was in ah, I, I I helped co-found uh, One World, which is an Israeli World Federalist organization, um, with Oded Gilad, and then I was offered. I was thinking about, from personal reasons, I was thinking about moving to the U.S. and uh, and I was offered to to work for for a few years in the Secretariat, working with the Workable World Trust and and. Uh, with the uh, with Bill and Jelena in the Secretariat and and with uh, with the UNPA, and um, did a lot of kind of work inside the corridors of of the UN. We did a, a lot of work on UN Security Council reform. Um, yeah, um, that's a lot. <laughs> and then um, I more recently I'm writing. Uh, I started writing. Well, I started it a long time ago, but I'm writing a book which is a kind of introduction to world federalism, to activists, to people like I was, and to people to my like my friends that are interested in climate change and peace, and to to tell them why you should care about world federalism if you care about these issues. Um, and also, and um, and just very recently, my, uh, I started working as a lecturer and a researcher in the University of Michigan. They kind of uh, agreed to adopt my uh, research and, and my book project, and also let me teach a course that's based on the book. The, the course is called the Activism and Global Politics in the 21st Century. 
uh, and it's also, I think a lot of it is gonna be about what we would call world federalism. Um, I, I think that's it. <laughs> I, uh, I hope that's, uh, that's enough. <laughs> I kind of, it was, I, yeah, and I hope I wasn't uh, fast forwarding through it too fast. No, that's great. But show me if I could ask you both yes. to move a little bit closer to the camera and Absolutely. to speak a little bit slower. People yes. will be able to see you and hear you better. Okay, okay. thank you. So let me ask you this, the next question, um, which is having been on the staff of the World Federalist Movement, and also being involved with other world federalist organizations, is there anything that stands out for you in terms of the kinds of things you think these organizations are doing exceptionally well, or the, the areas where you see kind of major room for change and improvement? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with what for me, and I think people said that yesterday as well. For me, it Can was- you move the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth? Yeah, absolutely. Is this better? I'm sorry. Much better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if I can turn it up. Um, is no, this that's good? Fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll say, I think, um, well, there's obviously a lot of this is, you know, part of what I'm writing about um, is that um, the, th the whole third part of the, of the book, and I'll also give a short presentation later exactly about that. But I'll say beyond what I'm going to, to show, I think it was so hard to find uh, the World Federalist Movement. It was so hard to join, um, so hard. So and it was so, you know, I think uh, movement, political movements that want to, to thrive, to, 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 to survive and to, to grow and to flourish needs to be a lot more, you know, engaging. We should be going out after people rather than them having to, to, to go and fight and, and find us and search for us. Um, and a lot of the, a big part of it is, and especially with the internet, is that people that, like me, that were searching for world federalism didn't know that they were searching for it, um, didn't necessarily know that that's the answer to the questions they're asking. They might be asking, you know, why is the world broken? Why are we unable to deal with climate change? Why are we, why, why is peace, you know, why is, uh, why is there peace, there's no peace in my area? Why is the United Nations working so badly? Why is the World Trade Organization working so badly? These are things that I think we need to be better at getting to these people and, um, and, and giving them answers, even if they don't necessarily know that they're searching for, um, for world federalism. Um, and to be a bit more concrete, I mean, I think, for example, the young world federalists that we're talking yesterday, they make great YouTube videos, I think, and that, that could potentially do exactly that. But, you know, there's this whole concept in communication, uh, which is, you know, part of my profession, um, which is search engine optimization, which means you tell Google what, what you're creating, the content that you're creating is about. So you create, you, you tell him what keywords are, if, are relevant for your website. And I think our websites shouldn't necessarily just be for people that are searching world federalism. They should be for people that are searching for answers about global problems. Um, and the YouTube's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, long, it's a very long conversation, obviously, but that's, a, that's one thing. I think another thing that I think for me is lacking is there is a, a lot of, as, as I'm saying that as a peace activist, that- Can you move should... the microphone closer to your mouth again? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Is this better? Talk and we'll know. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, so another, uh, another part that I think is, is meaningful is to, to, and I say that as a peace activist, is to talk also about other pillars of, of global governance, like um, climate change and uh, you know, the, the, interna the international institutions that deal with the global economy. I think we focus a lot on the UN and the Security Council, but we don't talk enough about things like the IMF, the World Bank. Um, the World Trade Organization, the UNFCCC Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's it. Um, great, great. Well, from, from our conversations, I know that you've reached certain conclusions uh, from your research on movement building and how it relates to the World Federalist Movement and their strategy. And, and you mentioned you had a presentation. Is now a good time for you to show that? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, and 
show this. Is this okay? Can you see this? Yes, and, and for the audience, if you want to go on to speaker view um, so that you see it well. Um, so I think, so, um, this is essentially about the third part of my, uh, of, of the book and it's a research that started, uh, 10 years ago uh, when I was in, in the London School of Economics. Um, and, uh, I called it, uh, federal strategy, the road not taken 10 years of research in 10 minutes. And of course, I mean, what I'm going, I'm going to try to talk through this and uh, it's, it's something that I think should be discussed a lot more at length and, and uh, but, um, but I'll try to make it uh, brief. Yeah, and, and just to let everybody know, you'll be available in one of the breakout rooms. So you, we, we will have more time to talk about this. Yes, and I'll just check. Yeah, that I, okay. Yeah, we see it. Yeah, yeah I was just checking that. For the videos. Okay, sorry. Just a bit of setup. Okay. So um so I the first part of of, of this is um is a, is a, is the is is on the left of this and I can't see you. So just one second. Okay, now I can. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to set it up. Yeah. So the, the first part of this is on the left. Um, and that's, um, and maybe I'll start before that and say that I'm going to just talk about two strategies that I don't think necessarily are competing, but are actually uh, in many ways complementary. And the, le the left one is a kind of classic understanding of how social change and political change happen. It's called the traditional view of power. And in that view, which I think is what uh, federalists have typically, um, the, the strategy we typically took from 1937 to the 2020, um, the understanding is that power is something that power holders, government, policymakers, diplomats have over society. And therefore, what you do is you lobby uh, the people at the top, you convince them, you try to change them um, and, uh, and their policies. And I think that the strategy that wasn't taken is, uh, is a strategy which is... Um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a top, it's a, it's a bottom up understanding of how power and political change happen. And in that uh, understanding, power holders actually lean, even in uh, undemocratic societies, lean on the consent and the active participation, active, um, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the consent of different groups in society. And um, this is, this is started to federalists didn't take, but it was taken by movements like the suffragettes, the movement for Indian liberation, um, the civil rights movement, and more recently, the gay marriage um, movement, and many more. And there, the kind of what you are, what you're aiming as is to shift the, the, um, the pillars of support that support the, and, and you, you aim at changing the uh, view of the general of general society. So you don't aim at, at the power holders, at the diplomats, at the governments, but you actually focus on the general society, on people, um, change public opinion, not lobby power holders. And um, the second uh, kind of element of this uh, strategy, except for the goal of focusing on on public opinion, is um, is that is how do you do that? How do you shake public opinion? How do you change? Um, and I, I choose the term dramatization, which is a, a term that uh, Jordan, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, used. He uh, used other uh, terms like creative tension or direct action. And other names for this type of strategy is disruption or strategic nonviolent conflict. And um, I don't know how many people are here on this call. So we say uh, 40 people. And um, the, the first Freedom Riders were only 13 people. 
and so they and they were using this type of dramatization that the freedom ride was a was a you know an, a classic example of an uh, dramatization action and uh, why were they successful why did they reach the first page of the new york times and manage to shift public opinion um so the reasons were that they managed to disrupt uh, daily life in the south in a way that the press uh, could not ignore so you know the a lot of people would say we don't like you you're annoying or the, the press you know the journalists you think you're thinking that you, they were doing uh, too risky things or they you know they, they were not they were wrong but they interviewed them and they said the reporters to cover them and they would never do that if they weren't disrupting um daily life in the same way um and they um they also were willing to sacrifice to do to take us to do actions that were personal sacrifice they were willing to risk arrest they were willing to uh, to risk um, physical violence and they chose a target to symbolize the greater injustice so they were interested i don't think they were necessarily very interested specifically in buses segregation desegregation of buses um but they thought that that was something that symbolized the jim crow um uh era and the, the general segregation um, in the US. And that's why they chose uh, the, 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 the buses as a target. So it, was this, it, it symbolized a greater injustice. And they used external events that offered opportunities. I mean, I think we can think of things like COVID or financial crisis these days. And in, in their case, it was the, the, the court case in the Supreme Court and the fact that states were not uh, in, uh, didn't follow that uh, order. We are roughly and, halfway through the 40 minutes now, just so you okay, know. Thank you. We're halfway through the 40. Yeah. Um, and so now I get to the third part of this type of the strategy not taken, and that's absorption. How do you grow? How do you use these dramatization actions into growing a movement? And the answer in the literature, there's a lot of literature about this issue. Um, is absorption. So when the dramatization works, when actions get into uh, a lot of, uh, you know, they they reach mainstream press, they they go viral on social media, people hear about them. And um, we need to absorb the new people that are suddenly interested in the issues that beforehand they never knew existed. We collect data. We we collect their emails to send them newsletter. We collect their addresses to send them mail. We collect their phone numbers to text them. Mass trainings is also a key uh, element in, in this type of movement. Um, toolkits and coaching to start in new chapters. Um, we've already made kind of st structure, strategy, and story of the movement. And, you, and all of this is essentially using an organizing model that can be easily copied and spread without losing its core DNA. Um, and uh, this is something that if you look at the, you know, you talk to activists, the, some of the main activists in Dream Defenders, so the movements, a lot of people were talking about that yesterday, the, the movements that we see as the future, you know, like the social movements that are around us, Black Lives Matter, Sunrise, the climate strikes, if not now, 350.org, Extinction Rebellion. These movements, if you talk to the activists, which I'm doing, I'm interviewing a lot of them for the book, that's the type of organization model that they work with. Um, and I think it's worth exploring and experimenting with. So this is the three, the three parts of that. Um, uh, so you have you know, the, the goal of shifting public opinion, and then you go from that to absorption, in making your movement grow fast using these tools, and dramatization. Or actually, I should start with dramatization, shifting public opinion, and then absorbing. Um, and I wanted to actually give some examples from our history of things that I think were uh, most similar to that type of uh, work. So here is Gary Davis. Continuing their debate on disarmament, the United Nations General Assembly was startled by something not on the agenda, an interruption from the public gallery. The speaker, a Frenchman, certainly held his audience, including Mr. Vyshinsky.
United Nations Police intervened, but next moment another speech was underway, made this time by Gary Davis, the American who calls himself world citizen number one. <laughs> Okay, um, so that was Gary Davis uh, essentially inter interfering in a United Nations General Assembly um, debate. And um, that also made news. And I think, uh, you know, it also got to the front page of the New York Times and got a lot of people into the movement at the time, uh, both in France and, and in the US. This is a, a campaign that we've done. I can talk about this maybe later in the Q&A. Uh, that I think was did something similar more recently in 2010 and reached CNN and uh, The Guardian, uh, uh, Reuters. And, um, but before uh, kind of finishing these presentations, I, I just wanted to give a few final thoughts uh, very briefly. And so the first one is that, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, the climate strikes, the women's march, the unlike the way that press reports them, they didn't happen in a spontaneous way. It's a craft. It's something that people need to learn, to plan, to train, to do a lot of trial and error. And it starts out of time with very small groups of people that are doing small actions. And it doesn't start big. Um, and um, yeah, there's a, lot of fur there's a lot of reading and watching that could, that's out there on this subject and this kind of type of strategy. Um, that certain some civil society uh, take, and so you can. It's very easy, you know. You can search the internet for civil resistance or momentum training, or email me. And that I'm also. This is just. I'm still not finished with the research, so I'm. I'm actually really love the opportunity to have a chance to hear from you, to get feedback, questions, what you think is missing. Um, and this is the the book that's forthcoming. The world is broken. It's going to come out in Beacon Press in a couple of years, and um, you can email me if you want to get updates on when it comes out or pre-order it. That was the presentation. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you, Shimri. Um, what I'd like to do, given the uh, given the time. Oh, B Bob, you muted yourself. I I can't hear you. Yeah, Bob, you're on mute. I don't okay. know what happened. Yes, but. sorry about that. Um, I may <laughs> hit myself by accident. Anyway, so what I'd like to do, given the amount of time we have left, is go right to uh, the group's questions uh, rather than continuing the quote interview. So I'll open the floor. And again, as we did before, first, I want to get actual questions. So if you have a request for information from Shimri, we'll take those first. If you'd raise your hand in the participants box. And then after we clear the questions, then I'll open the floor again for any comments. And the first one I see up there is Brandon. So why don't you take it away, Brandon? Just take yourself off mute. Thank you. Uh, first off, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so my question relates to the use of social media. We just had a little Twitter training for uh, the people here. How do you see Twitter or Facebook uh, helping with this absorption and uh, dramatization. Absolutely. I think a lot of the way that this happens is through social media. Um, it happens through, you know, uh, maybe during the civil rights movement, it happened more through press. I think these days, a lot of the type of, you know, the, the, the way that um, things go viral, that, that uh, that action, small actions become something that people know about is through uh, good use of social media. But I, I want to say that I think that uh, it's not a substitute. So you actually need to be in the real world doing this type of dramatization action for it to become something that people care about. Um, and, uh, and, and just maybe to explain something that I, I, I'm not sure if I was so... Uh, I explained so well was is that once it goes viral the absorption comes in then because how do you make that you know when something when an action like Gary Davis or the campaign that we did in England um, it becomes something that is reported in press that is spread through social media how do you make that into something that grows your movement that's where the absorption 
uh, comes in. Now, an easy answer is that then, you know, people follow you on Twitter. That's a kind of absorption. But I think we want a more deep uh, absorption. So if you actually want people to become part of the movement, I think training is, is a key. So to, do, to be effective in training and training trainers, that's how, you know, the Sunrise Movement, for example, work. They, they train trainers and then the trainers train trainers and then the trainers train trainers. And, and they, that's how they grew very, very fast. You know, yeah. I mean, one of my friends is uh, uh, in, in New York, worked with them when they were just five or six people uh, helping them to build those trainings. And it's amazing to see that it became something that you know, hundreds of thousands of volunteers in the U.S. in a couple of years. Um, and social media was an important part of that, of course. Great. Thank you, Brandon Shimmery. Next up, Chuck Woolery, let us know your question. You got to take yourself off mute, Chuck. Yeah, I was former chair of the United Nations Association Council of Organizations. I saw progressive movements were persistently divided by the zero sum game. They have to play in acquiring access to limited funding, uh, media sources, uh, attention for lawmakers and memberships. Naomi Klein called for a movement of movements, but each movement believes kind of they're the key to, to making things happen. And so they, they remain divided. Have you looked at the Tea Party movement growth in the United States? Uh, it was an extraordinary growth and success in moving from grassroots efforts to nearly 40 some members of Congress in only four years time. I, who is uh, speaking? I just wasn't, I couldn't see. Can you raise Chuck, your hand? Chuck Chuck wave. Wave. Yeah, Chuck. wave, wave Chuck. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the Tea Party um, is, is, a, is actually a classic example. A lot of the people that, you know, I'm reading and the, the that talk about uh, this kind of you know civil resistance and momentum talk about the tea party as an example from the right that is doing the same you know use the similar type of uh, uh of approach and i think it's a very interesting and I, I mean in israel where i'm from also i think a lot of the right wing nationalist movement as well use it this is a it's a strategy it's a tactic it's not a political approach so it's a tool it can be used for different political um visions um I, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions, if you'd raise your hand in the chat box or the rather the participants box. Okay, Roger, I I'm saw you had your flesh and blood hand up, so go ahead in. My, my hand is up as best as I can do it. I can't really raise my oh, hand okay, as a host. Okay, good. So let's get Roger But in after and Roger, yeah. yeah, thank you. Donna, you're, uh, Roger, you're still on yeah. mute, okay. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if you've studied, I've been co uh, concerned about uh, the use of propaganda uh, in the United States starting in 1945, if you've studied that end of it at all, because we know, for example, that many media outlets are what they call uh, CIA assets, media assets. Uh, they used to call it Wurlitzer's organ. Um, the great Wurlitzer, where theme lines pop up uh, we're seeing it in modern times now with uh, this theme line about uh, Trump and the COVID and whatnot. But in your research, have you looked at propaganda and how we can make some breakthroughs? Because, you know, America's in the war business. And so since world government would bring world peace, uh, much of the major... Roger, we have seven minutes and several people in line. We okay, much of the major, the major media doesn't apparently don't want to talk about world government and world peace. I'm not sure if I, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Have you break, studied breaking, the, uh, how to break through on the propaganda machine here in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think that was what the presentation was about um, in, in a way. It's, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, once you, uh, what a lot of social movements have been doing is using this strategy of, creating uh, actions that dramatize, that disrupt in a way that media can't uh, ignore them. Uh -huh. uh, and I think, you know, we in Israel, we did a campaign that used that type of strategy. And my friend uh, Oded Gilad ended up on NPR, you know, the Israeli NPR giving a 10 minutes interview on world federalism, essentially. Um, and in the UK, you know, again, we did a similar campaign, I can uh, give your vote campaign. Um, which, yeah, if we have time, it would be good to maybe another day to talk about, about doing something like that in the US, but it's very replicable. It's something that could be very easily done. You know, one 
person working for a month full time can do that and uh, can organize it and uh, during the elections and uh, it's something that got a lot of attention. Great. And again, we could discuss this more in the breakout room, but in the meantime, we have Donna and then Larry Whitner. I'll let Larry go ahead of me. Okay, go ahead, Larry. Uh, thanks, Donna. Um, isn't one of the problems with the uh, disruption uh, uh, strategy, the fact that um, uh, mass demonstrations, civil disobedience, other uh, disruption tactics uh, have become more common and therefore uh, the media uh, don't uh, turn out for them in a way uh, they once did when they were less common? You know, I was just watching. It's a good question. I, I was just watching the um, the civil right. You know, like a movie about the freedom riders uh, with my wife a few days ago, and I actually think that the, you know my conclusion was the opposite. I think what we are doing today is nothing like you know they went into the south with nothing when people were you know almost were planning to kill them. Nobody does that today when we're talking about this type, you know, what Martin Luther King called dramatization. We do things that are a lot less uh, risky, you know, if you think of Black, Life, Black Lives Matter, what they did, and I, I, you know, they blocked a road, no, but none of them have risked their lives. And so I think that in many ways, actually, with social media, it's easier today, you need to risk a lot less. But I still think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I still think that being willing to, to to pay a personal price, even if it means, you know, getting arrested for uh, for a few days or for a day, is something that's very, very effective in getting press attention. Um, Great. Thank you. We have Donna up next and then Vernita. I defer to, to Vernita. People okay, heard me enough. Vernita and Donna. <laughs> okay. You're still on mute, Vernita. So sorry, so sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, what role do you see for the visual arts, the performing arts, the literary arts um, in your work and in making uh, world federalism uh, known to people and inviting to people? That's such a great uh, question. Um, I mean, that, there's obviously a lot of different strategies and, and routes, but I actually think that it's interestingly, this type of actions are often much more close to things like art and um, and this type of approach. Um, you know, a lot of times they use puppets or because it's meant for press, you know, you always think about the photo. Op. What, what would be the photo that would be in the newspaper tomorrow? And then, you know, there's a lot more role for creative type of activities and for artists and, and, uh, and uh, so on. Thank you for, for a great question. Great, thank you. Still scanning for questions. So are there any questions? I'm look, I don't see any hands in the participants box. Question. In, any, oh, terrific. Okay, Jim, go ahead. So question, comment. Um, there's such thing uh, called generation theory that says that generations last 20 years and they have personalities. Um, the climate movement started when uh, millennials came along and Gen Z kicked in around two years ago. And sure enough, the climate movement renewed with Greta Thunberg and the Parkland anti-gun movement happened. And I don't know that it's coincidental that uh, Daniel Blewett has managed to get 5,000 names in the last 12 months. So I think the emergence of Generation Z is we went for since 1950 and could transform our movement. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, seeing no, no other questions, we have time for one or two comments. I'm gonna first pick on people who have not yet spoken. So if there's anybody who has a comment who has not yet spoken, you can either raise your hand in the participants box or put it in front of the camera. So this is anyone who has not spoken in the three days. So first, anyone who has not spoken in the three days. Okay, second, anyone who has not spoken today and I see Ann Zill's hand, so go ahead, Ann.
Ann is on mute. Yeah, you're still on mute, Ann. Ann. We can't hear you, Ann. You're still on mute. Okay. okay. Am I unmuted? Yes, you're off mute. Okay. You're off mute. I have I have two two quick comments. The first is that I wanted to thank Shimray uh, for his excellent commentary, and um, and say that I, I I I want to take issue with one one facet of his presentation, which is that we start bottom up, and that's the only best way because I think that. Uh, it, it, he used he mentioned suffragette mo movement I think at one point but 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 history tells us that um, a, a powerful change happens when it's both a bottom up and a top down as was the suffragette movement for example and uh, that's the only point I wanted to make about that but I also wanted to uh, 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 congratulate him on his understanding that art and the arts uh, inform how we create transformational change. And the final thing uh, that I want to end with is that I think it was Daniel from um, Australia yesterday mentioned something about the, you know, the nuclear movement being not an attraction for young people today. And I think that's one of our great challenges because nuclear destruction of the planet remains as dynamic and enormous and an, as, uh, as powerful a, um, a, a program for us to address. And I think most of us know that because it could destroy the planet in moments. So we, we need to figure out how to make it relevant to young people and all people around the world. Thank you. Great, thank you, Anne. So Veda will have the last comment and then Shimri will have the last word and then Donna and I will begin to wrap up. So take it away, Soveda. Um, so thank you for a wonderful presentation. I feel very connected because I spent a number of years growing up in Haifa where my mother served at the Baha'i World Center. So, uh, you know, kind of brought back a lot of memories. Um, you said something very interesting at the beginning of your presentation, which is about uh, your first thought as you, you, you started on this journey was about symptoms and cause, right? I see all these symptoms of breakdown, but what is the unifying cause? If we can go to the root cause, then we can resolve the symptoms. I've been writing and working in the field of global governance and World Federation for 18 years. And this last year I concluded uh, after having, you know, spoken to people of all ages and the younger, definitely more amenable. But the thing I notice is that, especially with the global challenges going on right now, what is happening is that people are feeling despondent, helpless, paralyzed, uh, angry, confrontational, and 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 apportioning blame. So the key to me seems to be to create motivation you've got to give people the vision and give them the why. The why should they hop on to the World Federation wagon, other than the fact that it will resolve a lot of the brokenness and the problems. But, but because it's more the what and the how, um, it, it, it doesn't grab people. So to get the kind of buy-in that creates movements, we need to look at the why. And I think that the we start that by focusing on something deeper. What does federation represent? It represents unity and the understanding of the oneness of humanity. And it involves a shift in mindset and habits. And so this is what the work I've been doing this last year. And I actually have a book coming on out about this, which is the alchemy of peace in January, because I, I really feel strongly that unless we get people to create this shift in mindset and habits and really understand the why, we're not going to be able to get them because there are so many theories about, you know, should it be a bicameral legislature right, or, right. or this or that? And, and we get lost in the weeds. And as somebody pointed out earlier, we start fighting amongst ourselves about details that really shouldn't matter right now. Um, so anyway, I'm curious to know what your view is, having started as a peace activist. Yeah. Um, about this shift necessary in mindsets and habits and really making unity and oneness one of the key um, concepts. Yes, 
No, thank you. It's such a, a great, you know, last comment for uh, for for this um, session. And I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, um, this is what I'm talking to you about this because I'm talking with people that already share this vision. But the book, so the book that I'm writing for Beacon is a book of, is for activists, people that don't know about world federalism. So it's not about, you know, it doesn't start with that at all. It starts with telling people, you know, if you care about climate change, why is it this something that you should care about? Why is, you know, what we would call world federalism is, is the answer. Um, if you care about peace, you know, why the Security Council is not working, why, the, you know, the different architecture that we have been security is not working and what could, you know, and, and also telling them story that, you know, Gandhi and Einstein and, and so on, you know, had this idea uh, 50 or 40 years ago that nobody hears about it, nobody knew about, nobody knows about, we all forgot about it. And they were saying that uh, if we don't create a more democratic, stronger, supranational uh, structure, then we're just going to end up with new financial crisis and a new world war eventually. That was their prophecy, right? And I mean, I, I think we look at the, so that's the, that's the, that's my message to people that are not you. <laughs> But to you, um, I want to tell you uh, the story of, you know, a strategy that we, we didn't really take as, as a group. You know, what Gary Davis was doing, he was doing as an individual. And we um, and it's also because, you know, it's something that really developed, had developed and grew and became, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a kind of a, something that people write book about and teach in universities and, and think about. This is a, a new, a very, an emerging field, you know, it's something that, uh, uh, 10 years ago, only a handful of people, 20 years ago, only a handful of people taught this in universities and today it's exploding. So, uh, and this is, you're right, it's a tool. I don't think I'm not selling people civil resistance as something to inspire them. World federalism is what will inspire them as an answer to climate change and so on. But I just think this is something that has a, a potential to grow because what keeps me awake at night is that we won't be able to reach a level, you know, we won't be able to reach public opinion, a shift in public opinion. And, and I think that, a, you know, an, a world war or a climate holocaust, and, you know, I'm using that as, as somebody who, uh, many of my people in my family died in the holocaust. Uh, ecological holocaust is something that's coming and we don't have time. We have to act now. We need to, re we, it's something that we need to move fast on and we really need to, we, we don't have time. So, I think we, we, if we wait for that to happen, that's a bad strategy for us, you know, for, for, for people to understand because of external reasons. I think we need to, to, take, uh, to take stronger action. And I, I mean, I think the strategy that I, I outlined is one way of doing that. I'm, I'm sure there's many other answers to the same kind of uh, problem that I, I hope I managed to outline. And yeah, I'm, and I'm, uh, yeah, I hope you, I, I'm not used to talking about the book yet and this research yet. So uh, thank you very much for letting me have this opportunity. You're the first people that I'm kind of having a chance, like stepping out of the library and talking about this, uh, this research in a more organized way too. And I'll probably be better talking about it in a couple of years, but uh, Bob threw me, you know, like I suggested to do this. And I, I said, I, I'll be happy to, although I'm not ready yet. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Shimri. I want to let everybody know that there's a whole other set of ideas that Shimri has uh, that, that we haven't had the chance to talk about that maybe you can do, uh, Shimri, in the breakout room, um, which is Shimri has some very developed thinking about why, before we were talking about the routes, the paths to a world federation, going through, you know, going in, working within the UN versus outside. And Shimri's a strong advocate for going outside of the UN and has some well-developed reasons about that. So perhaps that could well, come up as yeah. well. Yeah, during during the breakout room. It's par in parallel, yeah. Great, so anyway, I, I wanna thank you and we are going to move to closing. So I invite-